Let's pray. Father, as we come before you this morning, as we look at a passage, maybe a little unique passage, I pray that you would help us to recognize your word, to recognize what you have for us. And Lord, not just to gain knowledge, but Lord, that we would be challenged in our relationship with you from what we learned this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever had to defend a hypothesis when the evidence pointed to an opposite conclusion? Or maybe you've listened to someone who was attempting to explain away evidence that contradicted their belief. If you watch the news or read the newspaper, you probably see that quite often, someone trying to explain away something that points to an opposite conclusion. I remember when I was in high school, we had a, a, a project where we were looking at two sides of an issue. And you were supposed to study it up, and then you went up and you picked a little piece of paper that told you which side you had to defend. That, that happens in debate. If you've been involved in speech and debate, you sometimes have to do something like that. And so we see that, that it's hard when the evidence points in the opposite direction. But sometimes people will believe things no matter what the evidence says. And so they're going to do everything they can to try to ignore or deny the evidence that is out there and obvious. In Luke chapter 11, Jesus was accused by some in the audience as he was sharing. He was in, accused of being empowered by Satan. Now, the ridiculous claim that they gave actually pointed the to the evidence which showed that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, the one that the nation of Israel was seeking. So this morning, we're going to look at a conversation found here in Luke chapter 11 as we continue our series against the flow looking through the book of Luke. And we see the accusation is brought out in verses 14 through 16 of Luke chapter 11. Beginning in verse 14, it says, and he, was, and he was cast, he, Jesus, was casting out a demon, and it was mute. So it was when the demon had gone out that the mute spoke, and the multitudes marveled. But some of them said, he casts out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. Others testing him sought from him a sign from heaven. So what's happening here? Jesus cast out a demon. Now, something that he had done many times before. Just a little side note here. That this exorcism was just a little different from the normal that Jesus performed because this de demon was mute. A little context to that. There were, at that time, exorcists who would claim to cast out demons, and they believed that one of the important elements of casting out a demon was to make the demon give their name. Now, obviously, in this case where the person, the demon controlling him, that person was mute, that wasn't going to happen. But that did not affect Jesus or keep him from performing the miracle of casting out the demon. And what happened, the crowd observed what was going on. The miracle itself was amazing, but now the extra little layer to the miracle, they marveled. But there were some people in the crowd who did not want to recognize Jesus' power. In the passage there that we read in verse 15 says that, some of them, some of the people in the crowd, and, and we can recognize who that was, those religious leaders who had been following Jesus around, attempting to deny his message and his miracles. 
And so they had to figure out a way to discredit Jesus' miracle of casting out this demon. The people there, a large crowd watching, were amazed. And so they had to figure, how can we discredit Jesus? How can we discredit the miracles he does, this miracle in particular, and the message that he brings? And so what did these religious leaders do? They claimed that Jesus' power came from Satan. Now, you see in Scripture a little bit this term Beelzebub. Strange name. I doubt any of you will name your son Beelzebub. Uh, I would suggest you don't do that. But that term Beelzebub was actually a term used for Satan, and, and it actually has a, a background back in the Old Testament. Philistine God, and, and there was a, a Canaanite God named Baal or Baal. We read about him quite often in the Old Testament. And basically that term Baal means Lord or Master or Owner. And Beelzebub could loosely be translated Lord of the Flies. You may be familiar with that phrase. But it had become known as a, a not title or a name for Satan. And so these people were saying, listen, Jesus cast out demons through the power of Satan. And what do we see about these people? They were unwilling to change their belief about who Jesus was. So they were doing everything in their power to discredit his power. And then you see in verse 16 that some of the people ask him to do more to prove his power. They would never be satisfied. They said, verse 16, others testing him sought from him a sign from heaven. Do something else. Have, have God show up. They didn't realize that God had already shown up. He was standing in front of them, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And they'd been watching these miracles, which authenticated his power and authority, but, but they wanted even more. They would never be satisfied of, of what Jesus did. And we see people like that today. See the work and the hand of God all around, but... They still doubt. And so we see these religious leaders and their people in the crowd who, who would not believe no matter what took place. So what was Jesus' response? We see Jesus' response beginning in verse 17. It says, but he, Jesus, knowing their thoughts, obviously as God, he knew their thoughts. He said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided against a house falls. If Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? Because you say, I cast out demons by Beelzebub, and if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges." But if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoils. So we see Jesus' response, and, and Warren Wiersbe lay, lays out three different parts or aspects of Jesus' response. First of all, their argument was illogical. Why would Satan cast out Satan? Why would he destroy his own work in a person? It makes no sense. So sort of like in a basketball game, deciding that you're going to score for the other team. It's foolish. Now, occasionally it happens, especially when they're young and confused, right? I remember a guy on our team that scored for the other team because he forgot which basket we were going to, and he wondered why no one from the other team guarded him. <laughs> but you see, that would be foolish for, for Satan to de try to destroy his own work. That argument was illogical. 
But along with that, their charges were self-incriminating. In the back of their mind, the question, why or what power did the Jewish exorcist use in casting out demons? And they were focused on attempting to discredit Jesus, but not the others who claimed to do the same thing. We see that, right? Somebody does something. Somebody that you like does something. It's okay. Somebody that you don't like does it. You're going to talk all about it. How dare they do that? They should get in trouble for this, but yet others, you give them a pass. And it was self-incriminating. Why, why were they so focused on Jesus and not the others? Why were they consumed in trying to discredit his claim that he was the Son of God rather than to look at it and examine it honestly and carefully? But we see that their charges were self-incriminating, and then their accusation was really an admission to his power because they had to recognize that he demonstrated power in being able to cast out the demon as well as other miracles that he had been doing. And so the question wasn't whether he had power, but their point was, well, where did his power come from? And then he spoke of the ability there we see in verse 20 that he was able to cast out demons by the finger of God. Oftentimes we see God given human characteristics to describe some of his character and power and aspects of him. And so this is talking about God's finger. Now, the Jews knew exactly what Jesus was talking about when he made that statement, and, and he didn't just flippantly say, yeah, the finger of God. Because if you go back to the book of Exodus, that term, finger of God, had a very powerful principle behind it. When the nation of Israel was, was in captivity with the Egyptians, they, they were oppressed, they were slaves to the Egyptians, and God brought Moses onto the scene in the first chapters of the book of Exodus. And then God told Moses, you're going to take my people out of Egypt, and you're going to take them to the promised land. So what happened? God was going to give a series of ten plagues on the nation of Egypt, so Pharaoh would let God's people go. And if you remember the story, the first two plagues, the magicians in Pharaoh's court were able to counterfeit the plague. They were able to do something similar to, to and so Pharaoh could say, look at my sorcerers, my magicians can do this too. But then they came to the third plague, and I'm sure you have the plagues memorized, the plague of lice. Great plague, right? The plague of lice, and so Moses and Aaron went before Pharaoh, God, let my people, God says, let my people go, and Pharaoh was, no, he'd been hardening his heart, and, and so they brought lice, and then Pharaoh brought his magicians out to try to counterfeit, to replicate what Moses and Aaron, what God had done. But this time, the magicians weren't able to come up with a counterfeit. And so Pharaoh was angry. And we see that the magicians responded to Pharaoh and said, listen, Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. In other words, this is something that only God can do. Hint, Pharaoh... <laughs> pay attention. Of course, we know that it took quite a few more plagues before Pharaoh finally let God's people go. 
So here Jesus said, this is the finger of God. And many of those Jews, they knew their Old Testament could go right back to the plagues of Exodus and knew exactly what Jesus was talking about. The power that he had came from God. And that pointed to the fact that he was the Messiah, the Son of God, the one that they looked for. And then Jesus shares a story. And he talks about a, a strong man. And it seems sort of strange here, this strong man who guards his possessions and everything is good, everyone's at peace, until a stronger man comes. And so what's he saying? He's saying, listen, Satan is strong. But Jesus speaking, I am stronger because I am God in human flesh. And Satan will be defeated. And while they had watched the work of Satan in the life of that mute man who had been demon-possessed, they needed to recognize, obviously in the life of that man, but in the world, Satan will be defeated. And Jesus Christ is the one with the power and authority to do that. And so then he gives them a choice. And we see that choice in verses 23 through 28. The choice itself is laid out in verse 23. Verse 23, the crux of the whole conversation, and it says this, He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. We need to recognize this. It is impossible to be neutral. To not choose Christ is to choose Satan. Now, many in the crowds who had watched and listened to Jesus were intrigued, but they were not committed. And Jesus is saying, listen, you need to make a choice. Everyone who has ever lived in this world will be required to make the choice. Am I trusting Jesus Christ or not? Is my faith in him? If my faith is not him, in him, I am ultimately and automatically placed on the side of Satan. There's no neutrality. There's no fence riding. It's a choice. Jesus said, you're either for me or you're against me. You're not sitting on the sidelines in neutral. C.S. Lewis talks about this in his book, Mere Christianity. And he talks about the foolishness of this person who says this. This person would say, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say, Lewis tells us. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. You must make your choice. And he goes on and talks about that, and, and he uses the, the terminology, he's either liar, lunatic, or Lord. He's either deceiving you, he's out of his mind, or he's who he claims to be. And each and every person will have to make a decision on what they're going to believe. Is he liar, lunatic, or Lord? And then Jesus goes on in the next verses and he describes why they could not simply sit on the sidelines. And he uses a story of demon possession here in verses 24 through 26. He says, when an unclean spirit does, goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest. And finding none, he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of the man is worse than the first. Again, sort of a strange story. The first one in those verses we just read in verses 21 through 22, where a strong man protects his house and a stronger man comes and takes, takes it over. 
And now he's talking about, okay, this man's demon possessed, the demon is pulled out, and the house is all cleaned up, but then the demon comes back with seven others, and it's worse for the man than in the beginning. What was Jesus telling them? What's he telling us? You see, if that house is vacant, Satan's going to come back in. Even though that demon was kicked out of the house, he came back with others with him, and it's going to be worse than before. You need to replace that demon with Jesus Christ. And without Christ, you have no hope against Satan. Now, this also some brings some encouragement because we talk about demon possession, demon oppression, and I think there's people that are way out there talking about this. They see demons behind every tree and, and all these things and, and talk about this. But demon warfare, spiritual warfare, is very real. Remember in Ephesians 6, Paul says, we don't fight against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Spiritual warfare is a real thing. But when Jesus Christ is your Savior and the Holy Spirit indwells you, there is no room for demon possession. Now, Satan is still going to tempt you, strive to get you to fail, to, to lose your testimony, to disobey God, absolutely. But with Christ and the Holy Spirit in your life, demon possession will not take place. But without Christ, we have no hope. So then... We go to verses 27 and 28. And it happened as he spoke these things that a certain woman from the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts which nursed you. But he said, More than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Now, we have something like you see in a lot of current political rallies, somebody shouting from the audience. But this was sort of strange. So Jesus is telling this story, and all of a sudden this woman calls out. She's not named, an anonymous woman, and she says this, Blessed is the womb that bore you in the breast who nursed you. And Jesus responded by saying in verse 28, more than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. That woman cried out with a statement of faith, but Jesus pointed out that it's more important to be related to God by faith than by family. What was going on there? You see, the Jews were God's chosen people. But a relationship with God was to come by faith, not by birth. And the Jews were looking for that Messiah, and there were promises or prophecies about this coming Messiah, but there were also promises about the mother of the Messiah, the virgin that would conceive. And this lady was honoring Jesus' mother, Mary. And it's interesting, a couple things here. First of all, Jesus did not rebuke her, but he reminded her of what's really important. Mary was a godly woman, but she was not to be worshipped. It wasn't about Mary, it was about Jesus. And it's about relationship. The Jews were focused on, if you're Jewish, you're in. And Jesus was telling them, listen, it's about relationship with God. It's about faith, not birth. And so we see that our relationship with God, it's not about religion. Well, I go to church every Sunday. Well, good, God tells us we should go to church, and I'm glad you're here today. 
But if you're basing a relationship with God on following a set of rules and regulations or, or fulfilling a checklist, you've missed the boat. It's about a relationship, about putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, the only hope for your salvation. And so this lady, well-meaning, but misunderstanding what it was all about. And we need to recognize in our life, we need to make a choice. Am I putting my faith and trust in Jesus Christ? Is he my hope for salvation? And I know many of you in this room have already done that, so then I want to challenge you with a second choice. Am I living my daily life putting him first? And that is what we're called to do, to trust him for our salvation and to serve him with our life. And as we close, I'd like to go back to verse 27 for just a moment. Because the lady focused on the importance of a mother. Now, Jesus reminded us that what is truly eternally important is our relationship with God. We also can recognize the value of a mother and today we celebrate mothers. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5, Paul was writing to a young man named Timothy. And listen what he says. He says, "When I call to remembrance the faith of your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded also in you." The godly heritage Fathers are responsible for this too, but obviously as we celebrate Mother's Day, we're focused on mothers. The heritage that we're called to bring to the next generation. And we talk of the heart of a mother. And so we want to honor our mothers today. And we're going to do that. We're going to pray for you in just a moment. We also have a small gift. I I know many of you picked it up on your way in. That's great. If you didn't pick it up on your way in, ladies, please pick it up on the way out. Just a small gift to show our recognition of a large job. And But one other thing we're going to do is there's a movie out now called Unsung Hero. How many of you have seen that movie? All right, quite a few of you have seen it. I I want to encourage you to go see it. And one of the main themes of that movie is the, the wife and mother who really puts things together when her husband is going through some really hard times. And... Uh, you know, it, it's easy sometimes to just complain about raunchy movies. We should spend time and uh, maybe even some finances going to the ones that are good. It's a fascinating movie based on a true story of a family that moves from Australia to the United States involved in the music industry. And uh, it's, it's a very, very good movie. And what we'd like to do, and we have a a donor that would like to help those who say, you know, I'd really love to go, but things are tight right now. If you'd like to go to that movie and you're not able to financially right now, things are tight, you got a car bill or whatever it is, uh, they'd like to help you fulfill that. So uh, if you talk to Jezer or myself, we'll, uh, we'll make sure that you can go to that movie and enjoy it. It's not here for many more days. It's already been here for about a week and a half, if I remember right. But I want to encourage you to do that, and it's a great reminder of mothers and the impact that a mother has, and she changed the uh, dynamics of her family when her husband was facing some really hard things. And so we want to show appreciation to our mothers, and so I'd like us all to stand.
I know uh, some, sometimes we, uh, in honoring people, we sort of, uh, sometimes they like to be more in the background. But we're going to pray for our mothers today. Pray for God's blessing and encouragement. And I know if you're a mother here, you may, things may be going great or you may be struggling. But God is faithful, and I want to encourage you and ask God's blessing upon you. Let's pray. Father, as we come before you this morning, may we recognize your great love in our lives. And Lord, the challenge that we've seen from your word, the importance of choosing you for salvation, but also choosing to obey you in our daily life. I pray for the mothers here this morning. I pray that you would encourage them, that you would just give them your peace and comfort. Lord, those who may be struggling, I pray that that you would show them your grace. Lord, that you would bless them for the impact that they have had on future generations as they have loved their children and others. Lord, just bless them today, and I thank you for them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please remain standing. I just want to encourage you, if you're going through a hard time and you'd love somebody to pray with you right after the service, there'll be people right up here in the front. They'd love to pray with you or maybe pray with you on a situation that's going on, a decision. Or maybe you're here today and you say, you know, I don't know what it means. You talk about a relationship with Jesus Christ. They'd love to share with you how you can know that your sins are forgiven and that you, your eternity is in heaven because you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. So I encourage you to consider that after the service is over. Again, remember next week as we pray for the nation of Israel. And right now, let's worship.